you found Mafia Legends. The best criminal channel on all of YouTube. Sit and relax, and I will tell you a story. When Henry Hill was born on June 11, 1943, Brownsville, East New York was a six-square-mile working-class area with some light industry and modest one- and two-family houses. It stretched from a row of park-like cemeteries in the north to the saltwater marshes and garbage landfills of Canarsie and Jamaica Bay in the south. In the early 1920s, electric trolleys and the Liberty Avenue elevated line had turned the neighborhood into a haven for tens of thousands of Italian-American immigrants and Eastern European Jews who wanted to escape the tenement squalor of Mulberry Street and the Lower East Side in Manhattan. The low, flat, sun-filled streets offered only the smallest houses and tiniest backyards, but the first and second generation Italians and Jews who fiercely wanted to own those houses worked nights in the sweatshops and factories spotted throughout the area after they had finished their daytime jobs. In addition to the thousands of hard-working new arrivals, the area also attracted Jewish hoods, black-hand extortionists, Camorra kidnappers, and wily mafiosi. In many ways, Brownsville, East New York, was a perfect place for the mob. There was even a historical ambience. At the turn of the century, the New York Tribune described the section as a haven for highwaymen and cutthroats and said that it had always been a nurturing ground for radical movements and rebels. With Prohibition, the area's proximity to the overland liquor routes from Long Island and the countless coves for barge landings along Jamaica Bay made it a hijacker's dream and a smuggler's paradise. Here were assembled the nation's first multi-ethnic alliances of mobsters that would later set the precedent for organized crime in America. The small non-union garment factories that dotted the area became ripe for shakedowns and payoffs, and the activities at Belmont, Jamaica, and aqueduct raceways nearby only added to the mob's interest in the area. In the 1940s, when the 5,000-acre Idlewild Golf Course began its transformation into an airport employing 30,000 people, moving millions of passengers and billions of dollars worth of cargo, what is now Kennedy Airport became one of the single largest sources of revenue for the local hoods. Brownsville, East New York, was the kind of neighborhood that cheered successful mobsters the way West Point cheered victorious generals. It had been the birthplace of Murder Incorporated, Midnight Rose's candy store on the corner of Livonia and Saratoga Avenues, where Murder Incorporated's hit men used to wait for their assignments, was considered a historic landmark during Henry's youth. Johnny Torrio and Al Capone grew up there before going west and taking machine guns with them. The local heroes of Henry's childhood were such men as Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, who joined forces with Meyer Lansky to create Las Vegas, Louis Lepka Buckelter, whose well-muscled cutters union controlled the garment industry, Frank Costello, a boss with so much political clout that judges called to thank him for their appointments, Otto Abadaba Herman, the mathematical genius and policy game fixer, who devised a system for rigging the results of the paramutual tote board at the track so that only the least played numbers could win Vito Genovese, the stylish racketeer who had 200 limousines, including 80 filled with floral pieces, at his first wife's funeral in 1931 and was identified in the New York Times story as a wealthy young restaurant owner and importer, Gaetano Three Fingers Brown Lucchese, who headed the mob family of which the Varys were a part. And of course the legendary members of Murder Incorporated, the ever-dapper Harry Pittsburgh Phil. Strauss, who was proudest of the way he could ice-pick his victims through the ear in movie houses without drawing any attention, Frank Dasher Abandando, who only a year before Henry's birth went to the chair with a Cagney sneer, and the 300-pound Vito Sacco Guirino, a massive hitman with a neck the size of a water main, who for target practice used to shoot the heads off chickens running around his backyard. It was understood on the street that Paul Vario ran one of the city's toughest and most violent gangs. In Brownsville, East New York, the body counts were always high, and in the 1960s and 1970s, the Vario thugs did most of the strong-arm work for the rest of the Lucchese crime family. There were always some heads to bash on picket lines, businessmen to be squeezed into making their loan shark payments, independents to be straightened out over territorial lines, potential witnesses to be murdered, and stool pigeons to be buried. 
and there were always young capstan tough guys such as Bruno Facciolo, Frank Manzo, and Joey Russo who were ready to go out and break a few heads whenever Paul gave the order, and such young shooters as Jimmy Burke, Anthony Stabil, and Tommy D. Simone who were happy to take on the most violent assignments. But they did this work on the side. Almost all of these wise guys were employed, to some degree, in one kind of business or another. They were small-time entrepreneurs. They ran two-rig trucking firms. They owned restaurants. For example, Jimmy Burke was a hijacker, but he also had a partnership in several non-union storefront clothing sweatshops in Queens. Bruno Facciolo owned Bruno's, a ten-table Italian restaurant in the neighborhood, and prided himself on his meat sauce. Frank Manzo, who was called Frankie the Wop, owned the Villa Capra restaurant in Cedarhurst and had been active in the Carpenters' Union until his first felony conviction. And Joey Russo, a solidly built youngster, was a cab driver and construction worker. Henry Hill, Jimmy Burke, Tommy D. Simone, Anthony Stabil, Tommy Stabil, Fat Andy, Frankie the Wop, Freddie No Nose, Eddie Finelli, Pete the Killer, Mike Franzis, Nicky Blanda, Bobby the Dentist, so named because he always knocked teeth out when he punched anyone, Angelo Ruggiero, Clyde Brooks, Danny Rizzo, Angelo Seppe, Alex and Michael Corcioni, Bruno Facciolo, and the rest of Paul Vario's sidewalk soldiers lived without restraints. They had always been outlaws. They were the kids from the neighborhood who were always in trouble. As youngsters, they were the ones invariably identified as toughs by the police and brought into the precinct for routine beatings whenever some neighborhood store burglary or assault moved the station house cops into action. As they grew older, most of the arbitrary beatings by cops stopped, but there was rarely a time in their lives when they were not under some kind of police scrutiny. They were always under suspicion, arrest, or indictment for one crime or another. Henry and his pals had been reporting to probation and parole officers since their teens. They had been arrested and questioned so often for so many crimes that there was very little fear or mystery about the inside of a precinct squad room. They were at ease with the process. They, better than many lawyers, knew just how far the cops could go. They were intimately familiar with the legal distinctions between being questioned, booked, or arraigned. They knew about bail hearings and grand juries and indictments. If they were picked up as the result of a barroom brawl or a billion-dollar drug conspiracy, they often knew the cops who arrested them. They had the unlisted telephone numbers of their lawyers and bail bondsmen committed to memory. It was not unusual for one of the arresting cops to call their lawyers for them, knowing that such small kindnesses usually brought hundred-dollar bills as tips. For Henry and his wise guy friends, the world was golden. Everything was covered. They lived in an environment awash in crime, and those who did not partake were simply viewed as prey. To live otherwise was foolish. Anyone who stood waiting his turn on the American pay line was beneath contempt. Those who did, who followed the rules, were stuck in low-paying jobs, worried about their bills, put tiny amounts away for rainy days, kept their place, and crossed off workdays on their kitchen calendars like prisoners awaiting their release, could only be considered fools. They were the timid, law-abiding, pension-playing creatures neutered by compliance and awaiting their turn to die. To wise guys, working guys were already dead. Henry and his pals had long ago dismissed the idea of security and the relative tranquility that went with obeying the law. They exulted in the pleasures that came from breaking it. Life was lived without a safety net. They wanted money, they wanted power, and they were willing to do anything necessary to achieve their ends. By birth, certainly, they were not prepared in any way to achieve their desires. They were not the smartest kids in the neighborhood. They were not born the richest. They weren't even the toughest. In fact, they lacked almost all the necessary talents that might have helped them satisfy the appetites of their dreams, except one, their talent for violence. Violence was natural to them. It fueled them. Snapping a man's arm, cracking his ribs with an inch-and-a-half diameter lead pipe, slamming his fingers in the door of a car, or casually taking his life was entirely acceptable. 
It was routine. A familiar exercise. Their eagerness to attack and the fact that people were aware of their strutting brutality were the key to their power, the common knowledge that they would unquestionably take a life ironically gave them life. It distinguished them from everyone else. They would do it. They would put a gun in a victim's mouth and watch his eyes while they pulled the trigger. If they were crossed, denied, offended, thwarted in any way, or even mildly annoyed, retribution was demanded and violence was their answer. In Brownsville East New York wise guys were more than accepted, they were protected. Even the legitimate members of the community, the merchants, teachers, phone repairmen, garbage collectors, bus depot dispatchers, housewives, and old-timers sunning themselves along the Conduit Drive, all seemed to keep an eye out to protect their local hoods. The majority of the residents, even those not directly related by birth or marriage to wise guys, had certainly known the local rogues most of their lives. They had gone to school together. A great many of them shared friends. There was the nodding familiarity of neighborhood. In the area, it was impossible to betray old friends, even those old friends who had grown up to be racketeers. The extraordinary insularity of these old world mob controlled sections, whether Brownsville, East New York, the South Side in Chicago, or Federal Hill in Providence, Rhode Island, unquestionably helped to nurture the mob. These were the neighborhoods where local wise guys felt safe, where racketeers had become an integral part of the social fabric, where candy stores, funeral parlors, and groceries were often fronts for gambling operations, where loans could be made and bets placed, where residents made major purchases from the backs of trucks rather than from downtown department stores. There were other marginal benefits bestowed upon those who were raised under the protective umbrella of the mob. Street muggings, burglaries, purse snatchings, and rapes were almost non-existent in mob-controlled areas. Too many eyes were watching the street. The community's natural suspicion was so great that anyone who did not belong in the area was immediately the focus of block-by-block block and even house-by-house house attention. The slightest change in the street's daily rituals was enough to send a quiver of alarm through every mob club and hangout. An unfamiliar car appearing on a block, a panel truck filled with utility workers no one had ever seen before, sanitation men making pickups on the wrong day, these were precisely the kinds of signals that pressed silent neighborhood alarms. The whole neighborhood was always on alert. It was just natural. You were always looking. Up the block. Down the block. No matter how quiet it looked, nobody missed anybody. Late one night, right after my 17th birthday, I was helping in the pizzeria and dreaming about the paratroopers when I saw two of Polly's guys put down their coffee cups and walk toward the pizza counter window. I went over. Outside, Pitkin Avenue was almost empty. Teresa Bavona, who lived down the block, was walking home from the Euclid Avenue subway. There were three or four other subway people, all familiar, people we knew or at least had seen before, walking toward Blake or Glenmore Avenues. And then there was this black kid in a sweatshirt and jeans who nobody had ever seen before. All of a sudden the kids got eyes all over him. He was walking very slow. He walked along the curb for a while looking in car windows. He pretended to be looking in store widows, even though the stores were closed. And the stores, a butcher shop and dry cleaners, didn't have anything a kid like that would be interested in buying. Then the guy began to move down the block. I couldn't tell if Teresa knew there was someone about 50 feet behind her. Across the street Branco's bar looked quiet, but I knew Petey Burns was watching. He used to sit on a stool leaning against the wall at the end of the bar and stare out the window until the joint closed at about 2 in the morning. I knew guys were watching from Pete the Killer Abenetti's club on the other side of Crescent Street. Frank Soros, one of Polly's guys, who was later murdered, and Eddie Barbera, who's now doing 20 years in Atlanta on a bank robbery, were seated in a car parked at the curb. I knew they were armed, because their job was to drive the big winners from Babe's card games home so they didn't get robbed. To the guy following Teresa, the street must have looked empty, because he never looked around. He just started walking faster. 
he really began running toward Teresa when she started rummaging around for her keys. As soon as Teresa got inside, the guy was right behind her. It was very fast. He stuck out his hand and caught the door just before it slammed shut. That's when Teresa and the guy disappeared. By the time I got to the building, it was too late. The guy was supposed to have pulled a knife and was supposed to have been pressing it against Teresa's face, but I never saw anything. All I could see was backs. There were at least three tons of wise guys crammed in the hallways even before I got there. They had already bashed through the front door. There were so many of them that it looked as though the hallway and stairways were made of rubber. Teresa had squashed herself flat against the mailboxes. All I could see was the top of the guy's head and an arm of his sweatshirt. Then he was swept along with all the other bodies and arms and curses until he was carried up the stairs and out of sight. I backed up and went outside. Some of the guys were waiting there. I went across the street, turned around, and looked up. I could make out the small roof wall on the front of the building. It was made of brick, and then I saw the guy launched right over it into the air. He hung there for just a second, flailing arms like a broken helicopter, and then he came down hard and splattered all over the street. Henry Hill went into the paratroopers just days after his 17th birthday on June 11th, 1960, and it was a good time to be off the street. There was a lot of heat. The investigation started by the Appalachian meeting in November of 1957 had created a mess. After 25 years of saying there was no such thing as the Mafia, J. Edgar Hoover was now announcing that organized crime cost the public over $22 billion a year. The United States Senate had launched its own investigation into organized crime and its links to unions and business and had published the names of almost 5,000 hoods nationwide, including members and hierarchy of the five New York City crime families. Henry saw a newspaper with a partial list of members of the Lucchese crime family, but he couldn't find Polly's name. Henry Hill turned out to love the Army. He was stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He had never been away from the streets. He hadn't even gone for a drive in the country. He didn't know how to swim. He had never camped out, and he had never lit a fire that wasn't a felony. Other youngsters in boot camp complained and groused, for Henry the army was like summer camp. There was almost nothing about it he didn't love. He loved the rigors of boot training. He loved the food. He even loved jumping out of airplanes. I didn't plan it, but I earned in the army. I got myself in charge of the kitchen detail, and I made a fortune selling excess food. The army overbought. It was a disgrace. They would always order 250 meals for 200 men. On weekends, 60 guys would show up, and still they bought for 250. Somebody had to be taking care of somebody. Before I got there, the kitchen guys were just throwing the extra food out. I couldn't believe it. At the beginning, I used to clip a pan of steaks, maybe 30 pounds, and take them to restaurants and hotels in Bennettsville and McCall, South Carolina. They loved it. Soon I was selling them everything. Eggs. Butter. Mayo. Catsup. Even the salt and pepper. On top of selling them the food, I used to drink free in those joints all night long. I had it all to myself. I couldn't believe how lazy everybody around me was. Nobody did anything. I began loan sharking. The guys used to get paid twice a month, the 1st and the 15th. They were always broke just before payday. I could get 10 bucks for every 5 I lent if payday came after a weekend. Otherwise, I got back 9 for 5. I started up a card game and some dice games, and then I lent the losers money. The best part was on payday, when the guys would line up to get their money, and I'd wait at the end of the line and get paid. It was beautiful. I didn't have to chase after anybody. I kept in touch with Polly and Teddy. On a couple of occasions, they even sent me money when I needed it. Once I got into a bar fight with some farmer and I got locked up. Polly had to bail me out. 
I couldn't ask my parents. They'd never understand. Polly understood everything. After about six months, when I got the sergeant to phony up a double work shift for me in the kitchen, I drove eight and a half hours back to New York. It was great. The minute I drove up to the pizzeria, I remembered how much I missed it. Everybody was hanging around. They treated me like a returning hero. They made fun of my uniform, my haircut. Tuddy said I was in a fairy army. We didn't even have real bullets. I brought up lots of booze I got from the officer's club and some bootleg mountain whiskey. It was amazing, I told them. I said I was going to come home more often with a load of non-taxed cigarettes and also fireworks, which you could buy by the truckload on the streets. Polly was smiling. It was like he was proud. Before I went back, he said he was going to get me a present. He made a big thing out of the presentation. He didn't usually do such things, so everybody showed up. He had a box all wrapped up and made me open it in front of all the guys. They were real quiet. I took off the paper, and inside was one of those wide-angle, rearview mirrors that truck drivers used to be able to see everybody coming up behind them. The mirror was about three feet long. Put it in the car, Polly said. It'll help you make tales. Make sure to like and comment this video. Please subscribe to the channel so we can bring you more mob stories.